Now, the future of applications of artificial intelligence in education and in society is rapidly changing. Um, advances occurring in this field are occurring on a weekly, if not a daily basis uh, in recent years. So making predictions or exploring what may occur into the future and the implications of this is fraught with difficulty just because of such rapid changes and quite fundamental changes. But nevertheless, there are some predictions that are possible and that there will be changes. Um, and some of the technology and applications of this technology are already being seen um, to have significant impacts. Now, the first of these is around the ability of generative text and in particular generative images to subvert our previous understandings of authenticity. Now, in education, we're seeing that around uh, student assignments, where generative text is able to produce um, quite reasonable um, responses to traditional assessment tasks. And of course, in the image area, we're seeing a lot of attention being placed on what are called deep fakes. Now, we've had the ability to fake artwork for millennia. Um, and forgeries have long been evident in the art world, but that generally involved a fair amount of effort and no small degree of talent in order to be able to achieve that. With technology, we've had the ability to use tools such as Photoshop to fake still images for many years now, uh, for a number of decades. And of course, that had significant implications when it was first developed. The idea of being able to take out one person's image and put in another um, could change the meaning of an image. And certainly media organizations and other disreputable um, individuals have managed to create fake images and they've had an impact upon society. What's most significant now with recent AI technologies is the ability to um, fake video clips and also audio, which is another area that's having an impact, um, particularly with cold calling um, phone calls, where now we can generate uh, voices however we wish, and people are exploiting that through the telephone systems. But back to images and video, it's causing concern because traditionally we've had greater trust in uh, video images because it's been more difficult to uh, fake those. Of course, we've seen that happening with large movie studios, but even with that, it's been a gradual development from animation through to CGI, um, and it's only been in recent years where we've been able to create avatars, human-like uh, computer-generated um, representations of human beings, to a level where they're approximating human actors. Still haven't been quite there yet. But suddenly we've had generative AI being able to produce quite high quality um, fake video where we can represent pretty much anybody through digital um, avatars. Now this is going to have a big impact, positive and negative. There are some great uses of this. We can create a chatbot, for example, where we can have Julius Caesar talking to um, Cleopatra as two fake avatars and having that as an educational experience for the students so they can look at the dialogue occurring between two video avatars and improve the educational outcomes as a result. Or we can have um, use of teleconferencing and video conferencing where we can use fake avatars instead of our own images. Um, indeed, for online instructional material, instead of myself having to video myself and have um, my image presented to you, I could create a digital representation of myself or indeed of anyone else. And I could alter my voice or use anyone else's voice as um, your tutor. So this is going to have a big impact upon lots of aspects of education. But of course, it's also having a big impact societally. And 
there's no question that we're going to cope with it fine. We've coped with um, still images being able to be faked. We'll, we'll cope with video images being able to be faked. But there will be a transition period where people will exploit this technology. Um, and we're seeing that in some media in outputs at the moment. So with all of this happening, we need to consider the ethics of artificial intelligence how it can be used, how it can be used appropriately, and what is going to be acceptable use in various circumstances. One organization um, run by the United Nations is AI for Good, which is attempting to look at all of these different impacts and implications and exploring what things we have to pay attention to, what are the things we need to consider and put effort into ensuring that as AI develops, it can do so in a way that is beneficial to all of humanity. Now that's a big challenge, um, but it's a challenge that we've seen coming for many decades uh, and there's a lot of effort being put into this. Unfortunately, the technology is in some cases outstripping the capacity for policy and um, even consideration of these various issues, but it is not an area that's being completely neglected. Now, because of the rapid development of large language models in particular, that has caused a recent flurry of concern um, because it has clearly outstripped our capacity in the general community for policy development around the uses of AI. And one approach has been advocated is for a pause to occur around the development of very large language models. Um, simply because there are so many that it's taken them by surprise. Now, it's their own fault. Um, it's been quite clear for many decades the trajectory of how AI is being developed, and people have been warning about the implications of this for many decades. Um, but nevertheless, those in a policy-making um, area are struggling to now catch up have finally realized the, some of the implications and are trying to get a hold of the current um, spate of technology ad advancements and are trying to um, ask for a pause to stop any new advancements while they catch up with the current advancements. Now this has major um, ramifications and very little chance of being successful because there are many competitive uh, companies and indeed countries exploring the uses of these technologies and so losing the competitive advantage in that space is a challenge but the movement and the arguments do help frame some of the issues that we need to consider around the development of large language models and in particular some of these issues can be applied to education and so i want you to have a look at these various issues and the arguments being made and how could we look at addressing some of these concerns from an educational context. Now, the final, well, there's also other um, developments happening in artificial intelligence and ethics. Again, these have been under development for many decades, but they are now coming to their fore in terms of public attention. And there are two papers I'd like you to have a look at. Um, the UNESCO's ChatGTP, um, higher education report looking at the implications for education from large language models and the more general um, recommendations on ethics for artificial intelligence. Now each of these go through various um, perspectives on what needs to be considered around the use of artificial intelligence and more specifically large language models in an educational context and in a wider societal context. So look at the issues that are raised, which ones resonate with you, and some of the implications you can see for education from these issues that are raised around ethics. Now finally, I want to have a discussion on the open AI, not the company, that the open source developments happening in artificial intelligence. 
So while most of the attention has been focused on three or four major companies, uh, Google, Meta, and the uh, Microsoft OpenAI um, company, there has been also a proliferation of smaller developments occurring um, as a result of large language models. Now, the initial success was, a, was achieved by the very large language models that took a lot of effort and a lot of money to create and have been being explored relatively slowly by companies such as um, Google and Meta and I'm sure Apple's got one as well and so forth. Now, OpenAI released ChatGTP, um, originally GTP3, uh, to the, to, as a public exploration and it had reached a certain level and certain level of it, um, capability that exploded interest in these technologies. Along with that, there was also released from Meta another um, large language model um, known as Llama. Now, this was released as open source. Uh, whether or not it was released intentionally or not is um, up for question. But it provided the data set that could be trained by others. And it wasn't as big as ChatGTP and, and uh, GTP4 and things like that. So it was small enough for people to actually start doing their own experiments on. Now, it was released under a non-commercialization license. So people were free to explore with it. They weren't necessarily free to commercialize it, although that has been happening. Um, but being released to the open source community meant that there was a lot of experimentation as to what the potential for small large language models um, were. And it was reasonably quickly found that these models were still quite capable. And indeed, in some cases, almost as capable as the large models being released by the major companies, say ChatGTP, and they were benchmarked against those. But the most important thing was that they could be retrained using um, the data from individuals. Um, so you could take one of these models and on your own computer, uh, train it and retrain it on your own data. So you could put in all of your own papers. Um, you could look at where it's successful and where it's not successful and retrain it as you are retraining your chat um, models. So this has opened up a whole new trajectory for the development of large language models, not by the major companies in terms of very large scale uh, um, research explorations, which have uh, kind of caused a lot of concern and um, likely to be highly regulated. Now we have lots and lots of small models being developed. And these aren't subject to the same level of regulation, simply because there's too many people doing them. So an individual school, or in, indeed an individual teacher, or even potentially an individual student, could develop their own large language model, relatively cheaply and without a huge amount of um, expertise. Still takes a little bit of work at the moment. Uh, I was almost going to have you guys in this course do this, but it wasn't quite at the level for that just yet. But within a year or so, these models will be easily developed by individuals. Now that changes the landscape of artificial intelligence again, where we will have our personal tutors being able to be retrained by teachers and individuals to a much greater degree than was originally thought possible. So again, We'll explore this in the tutorial and some of the implications this has for education.